so you're looking for solutions for your next power supply design, but you're not sure where to start. Should you go for a silicon IGBT, maybe a silicon FET, or maybe a gallium nitride solution? Well, let's start with that last solution first. Maybe you know that GAN is great for high frequency power conversion for a wide range of power levels. But maybe you're still concerned about reliability and how it deals with component level failure and surge robustness. Well, my friends, you have come to the right place. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. As the demands for high performance and low cost power conversion increases, GAN offers several intriguing benefits for next generation power supply design. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Sandeep Ball from Texas Instruments and I investigate the what, why, and how of gallium nitride power technology. We take a closer look at the component level and in-system reliability for TI's GAN power solutions, and why GAN might just be the perfect solution for your next power supply design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Texas Instruments. Hi, Sandeep. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. It's very good to be here. Excellent. Okay, so with several types of power semiconductor devices like silicon IGBT, silicon power MOSFET, silicon carbide FET, GAN FET, how would a power supply designer know which power supply to choose for their application? Actually, there's a very good way to do that, Amelia. A power supply designer would look at a graph like this one, which shows the sweet spot of each device type as a function of power on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. The designer would choose GAN if they wanted to shrink their solution size by running at high frequency and obtain high efficiency. So GAN is used for a wide range of power levels and it has good device properties like low specific on resistance, no reverse recovery. And these excellent properties allow for a low capacitance die that can switch more efficiently reduce component count, and shrink the system size. Okay, so Sandeep, is GAN reliable? You know, working at TI, we have the experience of both silicon technology and GAN technology. And typically, for mature technologies, design engineers do not ask, is silicon reliable? The question typically is, did this set pass qualification? And GAN is there today because there's a robust reliability qualification methodology for GAN and a JDEC committee, JC70, with GAN-specific guidelines like JEP180, which we can talk more about later. The big thing is there's now a common approach to validate the reliability of GAN power FETs. And so the question is not so much, is GAN reliable, but did this GAN FET pass qualification? Sure, that makes sense. Now, speaking of qualification, what exactly does qualification mean in this sense? Qualification is a process which assures that devices meet a certain level of quality and reliability. And I've made a slide that breaks it down into two very simple steps. First, devices should not fail with best practice stress testing. So what is best practice stress testing? And the table below shows examples. Now for the traditional case, Devices have historically been qualified at 125C for 1,000 hours with an assumed activation energy of 0.7 EV. This translates to about nine years of use at a temperature of 55 degrees C. But for power electronics applications, the use temperatures are higher, about 100 degrees C or so. So the qualification temperature may be raised to 150C, and that results in about one year of usage for the qualification test. Second, there should not be many field returns. And many people wonder why we use three lots of 77 parts. And that is to provide an answer to this question. So this is shown in the table below, which shows two figures of merit. So first is the LTPD figure of merit, and that's called the lot tolerant percent defective number. What this really means is if there are zero fails out of 231 parts, we can say with a high level of confidence that there'll be less than 1% failure rate. 
The second figure of merit is the fit rate, and one fit is one fail in 10 to the 9 operating hours. And so we can say with a medium level of confidence that the fit rate will be less than 50. But the key point of these numbers is it assumes that the applied stress is representative of the actual use conditions. Now, it turns out that traditional testing is not representative of the switching conditions of power supply usage. This is a weakness in the silicon methodology itself, since silicon parts are also used for power supply applications. Okay, so Sandeep, when you say that traditional qualification does not cover the switching conditions of power management, what do you mean? A good way to illustrate that is to show the example of hard switching in a boost converter. This is a very common circuit. If you look at the figure on the left, the blue circle shows the low side FET in a boost converter, which is the hard switched FET. The figure on the right shows the turn on switching waveforms. Specifically, it shows the drain source voltage in red and the drain current in blue on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. So you can see at the start of the figure, the device is off. So you have high voltage and very low current. And then you get into the switching transition, which are marked on the figure as A and B. And you can see in this region, you get simultaneous high voltage and current. Now, traditional qualification does not consider these conditions and switching can excite different failure mechanisms versus possibly an off-state test that is done for traditional qualification. You can get heart carrier effects. You can get other power supply level effects, which are different. So how does the GAN industry assure that the parts are reliable when switching? That actually was a big focus effort of the JC70 committee. The industry developed a guideline for switching reliability which is called JEP-180, Guideline for Switching Reliability Evaluation Procedures, Gallium Nitride Power Conversion Devices. And if you're interested in actually getting a copy, it's a free download from the JDEC website. What I show here is figure one from JEP-180, and it shows the key aspects, how to obtain broad coverage, how to validate switching lifetime, and how to validate application use reliability. And these three aspects are covered by the use of the switching locus to describe the switching stress. The switching lifetime is covered at the component level. The application use reliability is covered at the power supply level. Okay, so there's probably more that's going into assuring that FETs are reliable for all conditions encountered, right? How does TI assure that GAN FETs are reliable? So we have a very step-by-step procedure, and we break it down into component level and power supply level aspects. And so if we look at the component level first, we break it down into three steps. The first step is that we run the established framework for silicon qualification and reliability, which is described by JSD 47 for industrial parts and the AEC standards for the automotive parts. We also use the JP122 publication for the physics. And then we add the determination for the GAN failure modes to ensure that we have the good lifetime for the GAN failure mechanisms using JP122 and JP180, JP180 being the GAN industry guideline. And we use GAN specific test methods again by using JC70 GAN guidelines, specifically JP173 which is the dynamic on resistance test method, JP182, which describes how to apply continuous switching test stress. And then we look at power supply level aspects. The first one is to run the dynamic HTAL test of JP180 to assure switching reliability in application. We also assure reliability for extreme operation like lightning surge and short circuit events. Okay, so... Sandeep, what are the failure mechanisms for GAN? There are three key failure mechanisms for GAN. The first one is time-dependent breakdown. Time-dependent breakdown is shown in the figure on the left slide. It occurs due to high fields, continuous high fields, which cause defect generation over time, increasing the leakage currents and causing eventual hard failure. 
This is well known in study for dielectrics used in silicon ICs and particularly is described in the JDEC publication JP122. The second one is hot carrier wear out. And in the previous slide, you remember I showed the overlap between current and voltage. This is the same data shown in a different way, showing the drain current versus the drain source voltage. And here it's very clear you have overlap between the current and the voltage. And the simultaneous current and voltage causes hot carriers, which can cause wear out of the materials and interfaces over time. And this can also increase defect density and cause eventual heart failure. And then on the next slide, I show the third failure mechanism, which is dynamic RDS on, which is charge trapping causing dynamic RDS on with aging. And so on the figure on the left, we have a cross section of the GAN hemp, and you can see the dashed line. That is the channel. That's where the charges conduct through, and that's responsible for the on resistance. You can also see electron charges dispersed over the high field regions. These electrons that are trapped will repel electrons from the channel. And so you can see the dash line becoming narrower. I drew it narrower to represent fewer channel electrons remaining. So if there are fewer channel electrons to conduct the charge, the on resistance will be higher. So if you look at the figure on the right, which shows drain source voltage versus time, you'll see when the device is off and hard switching, charges build up in the dielectrics and in the buffer layer and the interfaces. Now, when the device is turned on, if there are a lot of traps, like in the device with the red line, the on resistance doesn't go down to its low value right away because these charges take a bit of time to detrap. It's like a memory effect. And while these charges are detrapping, the on resistance is a bit higher and that results in more self-heating. Now, a good device with low trap density reaches its final on resistance right away, and that results in more efficiency. So dynamic on resistance can be measured right away, but what we need to look at for reliable operation is dynamic on resistance over the lifetime, and device aging can increase the trap density and result in higher dynamic on resistance with time. So we need to validate that new traps are not being generated with aging. So Sandeep, dynamic RDS on is new for GAN. How do you characterize and assure dynamic RDS on reliability? What we did is we put together a measurement circuit based on JP173, and we provide the stress based on JP182. And dynamic RDS on is difficult to measure because by the time you take the device to a tester, the traps have all discharged. So you need to measure it in situ in a system while it's switching. And so we measure it within one microsecond after the turn on event. And you can see some photos of the hardware that we built up. We have a coupon card that we put the actual device on. We're able to heat it up. We're able to switch it. We put it in a rack. We have safety infrastructure because this is a high voltage test. Our hard switching test system is able to characterize both dynamic RDS on and hot carrier wear out reliability. Okay, so let's go through the GAN failure mechanisms one by one. How do you validate that GAN FETs are reliable for time dependent breakdown? So let's go through these one by one. And so the first one is time dependent breakdown. And so you can see the cross section figure on the left of this slide showing the high field regions, the back end, the gate to drain the drain to substrate, the insulator. And so the way we went about this is we designed special test structures to individually stress each of these high field regions and stress many devices and built a time dependent breakdown model. In fact, we calculated it took about 1.8 million device hours of testing. And then we used the model to calculate the fit rate and one fit is one failure in 10 to the nine operating hours. For example, for a typical data center, server, and telecom power supply usage, our 30 milliohm part calculates at about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2 fit. So if you turn fit into actual operating numbers, what you'll find is if you run over 750,000 parts for 10 years, you might only get one failure from the TDB failure mechanism. And this shows that TI-GAN is very reliable for time-dependent breakdown. 
Okay, so dynamic RDS on is a major care about for charge trapping and device aging can increase the number of traps. So how do you show that dynamic RDS on will not increase with aging? That is a very key point. And so what we do is we use a very sensitive method of measurement of dynamic RDS on. And in particular, we use low duty cycle stress because low duty cycle stress provides high trap filling. And this provides higher sensitivity to charge trapping. And what this does is it provides an early detection method for aging by making dynamic RDS on sensitive to early traps, which can be less electrically activated, not easily detected by regular duty cycle testing. The figure on the right shows our dynamic RDS on results at low duty cycle stress over our stress time of 1,000 hours. This shows a range of our parts run at high voltage, high current, hard switching, and high temperature. And these dynamic RDS on results are very stable. And the stable dynamic RDS on at low duty cycle demonstrates the lack of new track creation and excellent material quality with aging. So Sandeep, finally, how are GAN FETs assured reliable for hot carrier wear out? Is this similar to the hot carrier injection test for hot carrier degradation in silicon? It has a similar purpose, which is to show that hot carriers do not cause wear out of the material. In this case, it is easier to do this test on silicon because silicon has a P body contact, which you can use to actually measure the effect of the hot carriers. For GAN, however, we had to come up with a methodology and so what we did, actually, you remember the switching locus plot you saw earlier, we can actually accelerate the voltage or we can accelerate the current. And so what we did is we applied stress using our test vehicle circuit and we ran a DOE and we made a model. And then with the model, we can actually evaluate the switching lifetime for broad application usage. And so if you look now at the next slide, on the left side, you'll see a figure of a turn on transition. Our model incorporates the switching waveform. We use the switching waveform to actually calculate the switching stress. And that leads to a very nice outcome because a switching waveform can be obtained from either measurement or simulation. And so if you look now at our switching lifetime calculations, and this is for operating conditions of 100 kilohertz and 125 C, You'll see on the y-axis, we have the switching lifetime. And on the x-axis, we have the switching stress rate. The blue and black points are actually measured waveforms. The green points are boost converter simulated waveforms. And from this graph, you can see that at typical operating conditions of 400 volts and 8 amps hard switching, and this is for our 70 milliohm device, you can see that you get over 1 billion years of switching lifetime. And that shows that hot carrier wear out is not an issue. Okay, so you've shown how you validate component level reliability using both JEP-122 for time-dependent breakdown and JEP-180 for charge trapping and hot carrier wear out. But Sandeep, are there any other modes for which a designer needs to be assured for which the power FET will operate reliably? Yes, absolutely, Amelia. That is the purpose of the third key aspect of JP180, which is to validate that the device and the parts are reliable for the power supply level failure modes. By power supply failure modes, I'll describe them in the next slide. Here, I've categorized them into four different stresses that are applied to the device or four different modes of operation. So the first one is the third quadrant mode, which is when the high side device is off. This is like the body diode conduction mode in silicon. The second one is hard commutation. This is when the low side is conducting in third quadrant and the high side turns on. And in a silicon device, this may cause reverse recovery. The third one is the Miller turn on shoot through. Designers like to operate CAN at high slew rates because high slew rates give you lower switching losses. But when you're switching at high slew rates, the fast turn on of, in this figure, the high side can cause the Miller turn on 
of the low side and cause a very brief shoot through resulting in lower efficiency and maybe reduced reliability. The fourth one is just the basic interaction of the switching power device with the driver and the other system components like digital isolators, the other power device in the half bridge. So do you assure reliability to these modes by running actual power supplies? Yes, we do. This slide actually shows a picture of our power supply board. And we run actual TI GAN half bridges at high power conditions and 480 volts for our 600 volt parts, 125C high slew rates to maximize the system level stress, 100 volts per nanosecond at maximum power switching conditions for a thousand hours. The graph here is a trellis graph showing the efficiency change versus time. And the scale of each graph is quite zoomed in from minus 0.1 to plus 0.1%. Each of these lines represent four parts because we run them in H-bridge configuration. And it shows very stable efficiency. And we've run a wide range of parts from 30 milliohm to 150 milliohm. In fact, this figure shows 64 parts. And the stable efficiency and no failures shows reliable in-system operation for both hard and soft switching. And in fact, this not only shows the reliability for the power supply failure modes, like third quadrant, hard commutation, Miller turn on, interaction with other components, but it also shows reliability to the component level failure mechanisms like time dependent breakdown, hot carrier wear out, and charge trapping due to stable dynamic RDS on. So sometimes abnormal or extreme conditions can occur in the field. How does TI GAN handle these events? During operation, abnormal or extreme conditions can indeed occur. And TI GAN is built to be reliable for these extreme conditions. For instance, a line surge can occur from an event like a lightning strike. TI GAN is surge robust. The load can short circuit. Built-in overcurrent protection turns the FET off in a latched or cycle-by-cycle -cycle manner. If the supply voltages go below a threshold, UVLO protection pauses power FET switching until the voltage recovers. The die temperature may get too high, such as, for example, if a cooling fan fails. If the die temperature exceeds the threshold, over-temperature protection turns the FET off and notifies the system. So Sandeep, I'm particularly interested in the surge robustness here because lateral GAN hemps are not regarded to be avalanche robust. We had a lot of customers asking about this some years ago. And so we did a deep dive into this and actually came up with a good methodology. And we realized actually something quite interesting as well. And our customers are concerned about power line disturbances because power line disturbances can occur due to lightning strikes and many other things like equipment malfunction. Silicon devices use their avalanche rating property to survive these events. But the use of avalanche is historical. And it arises because silicon FETs do not have much voltage headroom above their maximum voltage rating. So when a surge strikes, they break down by impact ionization. But GAN, what we realized, has good transient overvoltage capabilities. And so this actually allows GAN FETs to switch through surge without avalanche breakdown and any resulting disruption. We realized it also improves system reliability since over time, the surge suppression circuitry that's built into silicon power supplies can degrade. And this causes more of the surge to reach the silicon FET and subjects them to higher levels of avalanche, which can actually cause them to fail. That makes sense. So hard switching is more stressful for the device. Can TI GAN hard switch through surge? Absolutely. We came up with a methodology to show that TI GAN can hard switch through surge now, the advantage we have with surge testing is there's already a very well-developed standard for silicon called the IEC 61000-45 standard, which specifies the surge waveform. And you can buy surge testers that output waveforms to the standard. So we built a test bench using a surge tester and a circuit to apply surge strikes to GAN devices. And you can see the circuit in the inset of the figure on the left. What you see in the figure in the dark blue line is the input voltage that the device sees made by adjusting the surge generator. 
TI GAN is surge robust to 720 volts. And the way that we assured this is you can see the blue waveform going to a peak of 720 volts. And overlaid on the dark blue waveform is the light blue waveform of the switching voltage. You can see the switch node switching all the way through the surge strike. Now in this buck converter, the low to high transition is hard switched and the high to low transition is soft switched. In addition, you can see the inductor current going up to a value of about four times its original value. And this shows that TIGAN is very robust for surge. Now, how do you validate that it is robust for probably all the surges that you'll see for its lifetime? There is a standard called the VDE 0884-11 standard, which specifies the application of 50 strikes. Now, in our TI test, we applied 50 additional strikes to a sure margin, and you can see the figure on the right. And parts had very stable efficiency. There was no hard failure. And this shows that TI-GAN is robust to surge. Excellent. So, Sandeep, how would TI-GAN stack up against the list of tests you showed earlier? Very well, Amelia. I show that figure again with the component level and the power supply level blocks. TI-GAN has passed silicon qualification testing for the industry parts, JSD-47. For automotive parts, it would be AC q 100 TI-GAN is very robust to time-dependent breakdown, and as you saw, very much less than one fit rate. TIGAN has very stable dynamic RDS on. TIGAN has very good hot carrier wear out reliability. In fact, not something to worry about. And then at the power supply level, TIGAN passes the dynamic Ishtal test of JAP180, showing it is reliable in power supplies. It is robust to surge and it is robust to short circuit. Excellent. Well, Sandeep, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for all your good questions, Amelia, and have fun in building your high efficiency, compact and reliable GAN power supply with TI GAN parts. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Texas Instruments. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.